So it is 11.20 or 11.15, and no one has asked you how you're feeling. <laughs> um, obviously, that's my job. I'm actually being serious about that. <laughs> so how are you feeling right now? I had good and great. Um, how, many, how many of you would say that's like a sophisticated emotion vocabulary? <laughs> um, so, absolute pleasure to be here. And I'm going to get started by asking all of you to sit up straight in your seats. Please get good posture. Back straight. Take a nice long inhale, please. And a nice long exhale. Just let it go. So you've had the opportunity this morning to hear four amazing scientists talk about early childhood, prenatal, perinatal, uh, parental caregiving, and the role that it has in stress and emotion regulation. And what I'd like to do is extend that now to what happens when your child or a child goes to school. So with that in mind, I'm gonna ask, all, ask you all to do the following. I'm gonna ask you all to Imagine a child. Please grab a child you know and bring them into your mind. And for the next one minute, I'm going to ask you to live vicariously through that child. So you are that child. I don't care if it's preschool or elementary or middle or high school. And you wake up in the morning as this child. This is a quiet reflection, by the way. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to think, how are you feeling as this child? How are you feeling when you wake up in the morning as this child? Do you wake up to a mom or a dad who says, good morning, my love of my life. Let's come down for your poached eggs and steamed spinach and gluten-free bread. <laughs> or are you waking up to a mom or a dad who says, get down here, if I have to tell you one more time, I'm gonna lose it. And that's before you got out of bed. All right, at breakfast, how are you feeling? Now you're going to school. You're commuting. Are you in a bus? Are you in a car? Are you walking? How are you feeling? Next, you walk into your school. Maybe it's a preschool or an elementary school. You look around. How do you feel? Then we go into class one, class two, class three, class four. How are you feeling? Lunchtime. Are you sitting alone with others? Is lunch an easy experience for you or is it a difficult one? Now you are in after it's one o'clock, two o'clock, more classes. It's the end of the school day. You're walking out of school. How do you feel? Homework? No homework? Don't care about your homework? What are you doing outside of school? Wandering? Are you home alone? Texting? Social media? Third tutor? And it's only 4 o'clock? All right, you're home. It's the end of the day. What's it like for dinner? Is it a family dinner? Are you eating alone? Are you ordering? Are you in one room and your family is in another room? What does it feel like to be you in the evening? It's now seven, eight, nine o'clock. You're going to bed. You put your head on your pillow. How do you feel? So I've been really interested in studying the emotional lives of children and adults. And over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to do a number of large-scale studies looking at what are people feeling. This first one was with 22,000 high school students across the nation, public and private schools. And what we found was something quite interesting. We asked them, in their own words, describe, how do you feel as a student in your school? And this is what they told us. So they're tired, they're bored, and they're stressed. We followed this study up with doing experience sampling studies, which means we gave them all little devices and we tracked them five times a day for five weeks. And we asked them the same questions. And we got the same exact findings. <coughs> tired, bored, and stressed. If you accumulated the, what you might call positive and negative emotions, what you find is that about 70 2%, or I should say 77% of the emotions they are experiencing each day are so-called negative emotions. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like a recipe for innovation, creativity. So we decided, all right, let's take it a step further. Let's look at some other students. How about students who I get to teach? I'm in a very privileged position now. I teach the brightest crayons in the box. How are they feeling? Fabulously. <laughs> so they tell us they're stressed and they're anxious. Now, I was getting a little skeptical of these data because everybody's stressed, right? Well, that's what we're hearing. Everybody's feeling stress. So I really am interested in emotional granularity. And what that means is, like, what are the specific feelings you're having? So we did a study with 
these undergraduates. And what we found that was quite interesting, if you wanted to predict their anxiety and depression, their scores on anxiety and stress, I mean, their ratings of these words, like anxiety and stress, were not strong predictors. For Yale undergraduates, which was quite interesting to me, the top predictor of their anxiety and depression were feelings of envy and jealousy. Think about that. They're looking around all day, they're making comparisons. Who's better than I am? Who's smarter than I am? Who's going to do a better school than I am? Who's going to go to graduate school? Who's going to get into medical school? And then I went to the counseling centers and I said, what do you do for jealousy and envy? And they're like, well, we just do breathing exercises. <laughs> and I said, I, I, I mean, I love breathing and we know it works. Let's, but let's, let's think about this, right? You know, we got to get a little bit more granular in our strategies for supporting students. And I feel that the only way we can do that is by naming it. We've got to figure out what is the experience. Now, I've also been interested in teachers because they're the adults who are raising and teaching kids at least for six to eight hours a day. So we did this study with 6,000 teachers. They're doing even better. <laughs> they're not as stressed out. It's, isn't it interesting they say stress, but the number one emotion our teachers are telling us they're feeling is frustrated. And they're frustrated because they say, I don't feel prepared to teach the students that I have. I don't feel I've had enough ad adequate training. Uh, and the list goes on. Now, we have a lot more studies with teachers that we're going to be putting out this year, but one of the key findings is the following. What we found was, and maybe you can relate to this, the culture and climate of their school. So schools where teachers rated their school as having a negative climate, poor relationships, essentially. They were the teachers who experienced the most negative emotions. And in turn, what we found was the following. Greater stress, greater burnout, more anxiety, more depression, greater intention to leave the profession, and something even more interesting related to our last presenter, higher BMI scores. That teachers who are in schools where there's a negative climate are experiencing more negative emotions, and in turn, they're also gaining weight. So we decided, I asked one of our center supporters, can we just look at, like, what does this look like in the real world? So we did a huge study last year with 15,000 people. National study, fully designed so that it's representative from farmers to people who work in finance. And look what we found. So think about this. Our parents who are working are stressed. Our teachers are frustrated and overwhelmed. Our college students are stressed and anxious. And our high school kids are tired, bored, and stressed. How many of you feel like that's just like, we're living the good life? <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a tool we call the mood meter, and we like to plot emotions. And what I've noticed as I plot the emotions that our nation is feeling from kids to adults is that we are out of balance. We've got a lot of people on that left side. They're stressed, they're frustrated, they're anxious, they're bored, they're tired, they're exhausted. And people are not experiencing more pleasant emotions like contentment and joy. Now, I have one other problem with our field, which is that a lot of people think that the answer is happiness. Right, that we have to like strive for happiness. There are more books on happiness than there are people in New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> and it just blows my mind. It's like the pursuit of happiness, the goal of happiness, the, the, the track to happiness. And what I've learned, at least working with students, is that when their mindset is, I have to do whatever it takes to be happy, it actually causes them more stress. So we ask people, well, how do you want to feel? Raise your hand if in your life, at home, at school, or at work, you would like to feel more appreciated. Anyone? How about more joy? How about more excitement? A little more respect? A little more happiness? Yeah. Now, obviously, we're not going to feel this way 100% of the time, because that's not realistic. But we are out of balance. Right? We have to figure out ways that we can go from tired, bored, stressed, frustrated, overwhelmed, to, I think, greater contentment greater appreciation, more respect, etc. So our center, we call the Center for Emotional Intelligence, and we have a very lofty goal, to use the power of emotions to create a healthier, more equitable, more innovative, and more compassionate world. And what we do is we study the role of emotions in five big things that you've already heard about. So I don't even need to talk about this, because you know this already. What we know from our research is that emotions drive much of our everyday lives, from attentional capacity, it's kind of interesting listening to these previous presentations because I was going through my own life, of course. That's all we do. It's like we're so narcissistic, right? It's like, <laughs> now I know the answer. Because like, I was a C and D student. And I know you're looking at me thinking something like, how is that possible? 
because um, the truth is I am pretty freaking smart. Um, <laughs> but when I was a middle schooler, I was bullied, horrifically. I hated school. I was an anxious kid. And I was a poor performer, terrible test taker. I mean, I was more worried about survival. How am I going to get the heck out of this classroom to the bathroom without getting punched? How am I going to get home without being bullied? And when your life is filled with survival mechanisms, thinking about survival anyway, how are you going to be interested in the Roman oligarchy? I don't really care. I don't want to learn anything. I just want to have friendships. I want to be cared for. I want to be supported. I want to be loved. Second is decision making. Has anyone here ever made a poor decision? <laughs> so we've done research on teachers, by way of example. We studied teachers a couple years ago, many different ways. This particular study was we randomly assigned teachers to be in a good mood or a bad mood. It's pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> you just say, write about one of the best days you had in the classroom and write about one of the worst days. And then you randomly assign them to those two conditions. It works like a charm. But what we did was we all, we gave them a set of papers to grade, and the same paper. And we just said, evaluate this for creativity, for grammar, for all different kinds of traditional um, grading procedures. And what we found was one and a half to two full grades difference. Now, I kind of knew that because I know how our brain operates when we're experiencing these different types of emotions. But we needed to show it. But most importantly, at the end of the study, we asked the teachers, do you believe that how you felt had any influence over your grade? 90% said no. They said, no way. I mean, I feel this way or whatever. Like, why would that influence my evaluation? So I think that what that tells us is that how we feel oftentimes drives our cognition, our decision-making, our behavior, but it happens oftentimes outside of our conscious awareness. Think about it. How many of you have ever been cruel, I mean, I mean not, mean <laughs> to your own partner or child? Come on, everybody raise your hand. <laughs> and how many of you, while you're doing it, you're saying to yourself, I am intentionally trying to do damage. <laughs> well, we don't do that, right? We're triggered because we're tired and we're depleted of our resources and we go for the jugular and we don't realize we're doing it oftentimes. So our emotions do have this interesting influence, don't they? The third is relationships. I'm curious, does anyone here work with someone who looks like this? Does anyone work with someone like that? <laughs> and how many of you, when you read that person's facial expression, say something to yourself like the following, I want to work with them for the rest of my life. <laughs> Emotions are signals, aren't they? They're signals to approach or to avoid. Right? Strong, kind of disgust, contemptuous facial expressions say what? Stay away. I'm more powerful than you are. I don't really care about you. It's quite interesting, and it's quite subtle. <coughs> Positive emotions, joy, contentment. What do they say? I'm here for you. I want to listen to you. I'm supportive of you. The fourth is physical and mental health. I don't need to go there. You've heard a lot about that today. But what I will tell you is that in the state of Connecticut, where I'm doing quite a lot of work, accumulated evidence shows every year for the last six years, every year for the last six years, there has been a 20% increase in college students seeking mental health treatment. Which means that at a place like Yale, 50% of the undergraduates will seek counseling before they graduate. That's a lot. And uh, it's very interesting. I gave a presentation on these data at my university and the counseling center. They got mad at me, like, you know, it's because of you. Everybody's talking about their feelings. <laughs> right? <laughs> and the, one, the counseling center, she said, and even the football players are talking about their emotions now. <laughs> and I said, yeah, exactly. I have a lot of feelings about that, but we'll go there later. <laughs> and obviously, performance and creativity. Let's think about it. To get where all of you are in life, we have to deal with difficult emotions. Has anyone here ever been disappointed towards a goal? How about frustrated? How about overwhelmed? How about you've gotten feedback that you didn't like? So life is about perceiving different emotions and managing them effectively. The question is, what do we do with our emotional lives? So we have a framework we call RULER, and it is a way of thinking about the discrete skills of emotional intelligence. It's the idea of how do we use our emotions wisely? How do we take that information and digest it and strategize accordingly? The first skill is recognizing emotion. That's both self and other. Am I reading other people accurately through face, body, voice? 
Am I reading my own emotions accurately? Am I paying attention to my cognition and my physiology and even my own body language? The second skill is understanding emotion. Why am I feeling this way? Where's it coming from? Like anger and disappointment, what is the difference? Jealousy and envy, like what is the difference? I don't have time to go through that right now, but you might at lunch try to disentangle those two emotions. What are the differences in the experiences of anger and disappointment and jealousy and envy? And maybe we'll give you an award at the end of the day if you don't cheat and look online. <laughs> the third skill is labeling. Do you have the words? Are you down or disappointed or hopeless? Are you feeling happy, elated, or ecstatic? Are you tranquil or peaceful or content? Are you peeved, irritated, angry, or enraged? We say you have to name it to tame it. The fourth is expressing emotions, knowing how and when to express emotions across context and culture. It's very interesting, I have two older brothers, <clears throat> and because of our own trauma in my household, I was an only child from when I was six. I had a middle brother who was psychiatrically hospitalized, and I had an older brother who already went off to college, but then he developed Crohn's disease, and he was hospitalized for Crohn's disease. So I had a mom who was pretty stressed out, and a dad who was trying to make ends meet. We didn't grow up together, pretty much, but when I, you know, do what I do, I ask my brothers, I said, hey Dave, Steve, like you don't even know what I do. They're convinced I just make money by thinking in coffee shops. So I was like, I have a career, like I write papers, I teach. So they came to hear me do a presentation like this, and I'm talking about my bullying, and I'm talking about my mother having anxiety and stress, and my father being angry, and I see my brothers like freaking out. Like my one brother's like, you know, like. <laughs> so at the end of my talk, I go to my brother, and he goes like, what are you doing? I said, I said, what do you mean? This is like what I do. He's like, you're too vulnerable. <laughs> He's like, and people are going to think you're weak. You share too much. People shouldn't know this about you. You're a professor, right? People, you're going to, and he just, he looked at me, he goes, and that weakness, you don't want that perception. I was like, Dave, <laughs> like, in my department, we call that projection, right? <laughs> like, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. So, right, we have rules, don't we? We create these rules in our world about emotions, like, is it safe to talk about your feelings? Think about that first presentation, or I can't remember, first or second one. These, these parents who are leaving their homes without saying goodbye. Right? What is going on that they're uncomfortable talking about their feelings and saying it's going to be okay, I'll see you later, have a great day, I love you. What's going on in our society that it's not happening? The final skill is regulating emotions, having those strategies to upregulate. Sometimes it's not just about dealing with stress. Sometimes, like, you've got to get into that yellow quadrant and be inspirational. Sometimes you've got to be calm. Sometimes, you know what, in schools, you want to be reflective in that blue to really be um, deeply thinking about a poem you're going to write. So what we find in our research is the following. Lower or higher in emotional intelligence. These are based on performance assessments. So we've created assessment tools that are not just asking people because I find there's zero correlation between what people say they have and what they actually have when it comes to emotional intelligence. Um, the only thing that self-reported emotional intelligence predicts is narcissism. <laughs> so you can see here, children who score higher on these assessments are doing pretty well. I've also been interested in, in schools in terms of a leader's emotional intelligence. Remember earlier I showed you those data about frustrated and stressed for teachers? Well, look at these. When you break up data and you look at a school that has a principal with more developed emotion skills, it looks a little different, doesn't it? Just one person can make the difference in how a whole group of people feel in an environment. And guess what? It's correlated with their emotional exhaustion and their intentions to leave the profession. So emotions matter. Raise your hand. Yes or no? Yes. All right. The skills are real? Oh, there's some hesitancy there. Yeah. <laughs> I got more work to do. So the question is, how do we develop it? I think there's two ways. There's the informal and the formal. We all learned about this informally. I did. I grew up in a family with a mother. So I would come home and say things like this. Mom, I'm being bullied. I can't. Oh, my God, honey, it's happening again? Don't tell me the details. I'll have a breakdown. <laughs> and I would be like, wait a minute, Mom. Like, I'm having the freaking breakdown. <laughs> like, you support me. Right? Um, and my father was a tough guy from the Bronx. He'd say, son, you gotta toughen up. Do I look like a tough guy? Like, <laughs> I mean, I do have a fifth degree black belt. I mean, I kinda, I'm, I'm skilled, but I'm not a tough guy. Like, it's not even my genes. I don't have it. So, I don't know about those strategies. <laughs> the informal, you know, watching television, 
I don't know, maybe not the best pathway. So we've decided let's create formal pathways. We have an approach we call ruler. And one of my urges is to move away from piecemeal approaches. Too many assemblies, too many rules, too many kits and you know, weekly lessons and activities. Let's think systemically. Why don't we think about infusing the principles of emotional intelligence into the immune system of our homes and schools? So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. In a school, it means it's not just about one teacher going to a workshop. It means we have to think systemically. We've got to think about leaders and teachers. We've got to think about classroom integration. We have to think about school-wide policies and procedures. We have to think about family education and outside of school time. And when we do that, we think also about three layers. One, we have to get people's mindsets on board. I don't know about you, but not everyone is on my bus. And it drives me nuts. I'll give you an example about this. I gave a talk at a prestigious university that will remain, it'll be nameless for now. And I'm talking to about 100 surgeons. And at the end of my presentation, this one interesting surgeon stood up and said the following to me. He goes, Mark, this is we're about producing Nobel laureates, not nice people. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I'm driving an empty bus, at least in this department. And it was really painful. And I looked over at the chair of the department. I said, you know, can you explain this to me? He's like, why do you think you're here? <laughs> <laughs> so the second is that we have to focus on those skills. We've got to develop people's skills. We've got to get those skills in people's lives. Teach them the, the labels for their feelings. Teach them strategies. And then we can't just do that. We have to focus on the culture and climate. Right? We can't expect one teacher to go to a training and then permeate a whole system. We've got to <laughs> infuse these principles into the system so that's the way we lead and teach and interact in the hallways and in the playgrounds and the faculty rooms. And then what research shows is that great things happen. You get the outcomes that you're interested in, not, in our, on only, not only in our own research, but when you look at meta-analyses. So our work looks like this, and I'll just spend a few minutes on this to wrap up. We say, too many rules, not enough feelings. Why not ask people in your school how they want to feel? It's very interesting to ask that question. And let me tell you, schools struggle with that. I've had schools tell me, we can't get through this exercise. We are so dysfunctional here that people just mock us, and they roll their eyes. So think about that. The adults are rolling their eyes being asked a simple question, how do you want to feel? How is that impacting student learning and development? These are our two flagship schools in New York City. This is a school in Harlem. They want to feel inspired and peaceful and fulfilled. That's another school, balanced and energized, proud and safe. These are from here. We have a partner school, by the way, the Willows Community School, who are here today, where we're starting our first training next week. We have 21 schools sign up, which we're super excited about. This is a charter from their school. This is early childhood. They don't have necessarily the language, but they can draw how they want to feel in school. Fifth grade, confident, creative, focused, ecstatic, respected. And then people get super creative where they draw things and they create little images to describe how they want to feel. The mood meter helps us build that language. It's an evidence-based tool that says emotions can be viewed as a product of our perceptions of appra our appraisals of pleasantness and our arousal, or pleasantness and energy and we can divide that into four quadrants and then build vocabulary that covers the full spectrum of the human emotional experience. We talk a lot about emotion regulation in our work. Unfortunately, not every strategy works for everybody. Think about that. Right? How many have ever been told to calm down? <laughs> or how many of you maybe had something like, I need you to focus. As soon as someone tells me to focus, it's a trigger for me because I have attentional problems. And it's like, whoa, like that is not working. <laughs> what we find in our work with children especially, it's emotion specific. How I regulate anger is different than how I regulate disappointment. It's contextualized. What I can do in my classroom may not be permitted at home, vice versa. It's gotta be personalized and culture responsive. It's gotta be development appropriate, permitted, encouraged, practiced, and it's gotta be evaluated and refined. Like, is that strategy working? Like that plan B and plan C. It's also about infusing emotions into teaching and learning. There are different moods that work for different purposes. There are other ways of doing this, like this is a personalized approach where kids create their own mood meters and then they do tracking across the week. We even have an app that we've designed to help people build their own skills by plotting and tracking their time over time. We also have a tool we call the Meta Moment. Raise your hand if you've ever been tired and bored and stressed. 
and you've made mistakes in the way you've interacted with people when you felt that way. So we have a six-step process. We say if you take our six steps seriously now, you can avoid the 12 steps later. <laughs> um, and it involves an interesting piece we call the best self. Activating that best self to help you find that strategy to support you. Interesting creative ways of doing this. There are other tools that we call the blueprint, which is it's not just about us or me, it's about us and we. How are you feeling? Do I know how you feel? And interesting creative ways of doing problem solving and perspective taking exercises. We have a more advanced work where we help kids develop age appropriate emotion vocabulary through storytelling, through linking it to the academic curriculum, through going home and teaching their parents words, and finally through thinking about the strategies that will work for them to help them manage those emotions. Let me wrap up by saying the following. Our own research shows that this makes a difference. It helps students live healthier lives. It changes the culture and climate of schools in really interesting ways, and it helps teachers um, be less stressed out and have greater job satisfaction. And I'll end by saying a few things. One, emotions matter. Raise your hand again. How many of you are on my bus? All right, good. Emotional intelligence is a real set of skills. Are we there? All right, they're not soft skills. They're not non-academic. There are creative ways to do this work, I promise you. We have one approach. There are many, many creative ways of doing this. I would argue that I want you to think systemically as opposed to in a piecemeal way. I believe, and the research shows, it's never too early or too late to develop these skills. You can always build your vocabulary. You can always learn new strategies. I'll lastly say I'm on a mission. I believe this is the missing piece in our education system. I believe that if we start giving our nation's children and the adults who are raising them and teaching them the permission to feel, great things will happen. We will have more equity in this world. We will have greater compassion. We will have more innovation. And I think most importantly, we will create a world where every child can achieve their dreams. Thank you.